Okay, they're bringing in Dr. Hughes again. If y'all remember, this woman is a Looney Tunes. She is batshit crazy. So let's prepare for Thank insanity. Thank you, Dr. Survivor. You're still under oath, okay, yes, ma'am? Thank you. And just know she's going to lie, and manipulate, you just remind the jury et cetera. Sure, I'm a clinical and forensic psychologist. I am board certified in forensic psychology. I am the president-elect of the trauma division of the American Psychological Association. This is Amber's and last I desperate Amber Heard plea over six visits to the jury. For approximately 29 hours. Okay. And why are you here today? To offer a rebuttal testimony to try to, to make Shannon a name for Curry's myself. Testimony of yesterday. Okay. Now, Dr. Curry said you used improper methods. Would you agree with that? No, I would not. Why? Of course she Please wouldn't. I, as I testified to you all uh, several weeks ago, I used a standard forensic procedure that is well established in our field. It is a multi-method, multi-hypothesis driven me um, procedure where you're looking at a variety of different details and tests and external data to arrive at an opinion and you're looking at the consistency across that data. There are three sort of sets of, of tests that we use as forensic psychologists, and I think that's where it seems that Dr. Curry seems confused. We have forensic assessment instruments. Those are instruments that are very neatly tied to a legal criteria. Um, those are most notably done in a criminal court for competency. If someone has competency to stand trial, we have very clear measures that can track that legal criteria. The next level are forensically relevant instruments. And those instruments are not linked to a specific legal criteria, but they do have information that's germane to that finding. And that can be an example of a risk assessment measure and a malingering measure. So the malingering measure was, that I utilized was the MFAST, and that was the only malingering measure in this case. Jeez. The third category are clinical assessment instruments, and those are instruments that are validated and well-researched and used in the clinical realm as we understand people's symptomatology and diagnostic um, and functional capacities. Those are things like the MMPI, the PAI, the CAPS, the TSI, because they are clinically relevant and they still give us very valuable information to individuals who are involved in a court case. And the reason that we do that and we use these clinical measures is because the majority of the people that we see are in a clinical realm. They're not in a courtroom. Um, so they're well validated and well researched. Methods. Right. What we also do is use a very different types of tests within that category. We use some checklists, some face valid checklists. We use some tests that are those broadband personality inventories. We use structured clinical interviews. And then we look for the consistency across those data points. Right. And when we use different types of tests, it gives us information about the individual, how they go about these tests Bye. in these different modalities. Now, she's insufferable. Dr. Curry seemed to suggest that, that Amber Heard uh, tested the most extreme category in, in all of these different tests. Is that accurate? That Objection is, compound. Uh, Overruled. That is not accurate. They were not on the checklist. I mean, people sometimes do. They go, all the time. This happens to me all the time, frequently. And that is not how she endorsed these tests. She endorsed them in a very moderate way. Yeah, in right. In a very nuanced way. We've all seen her, her symptoms, insanity. Um, that I determined was um, accurate and reliable. Now, Dr. Curry also suggested that uh, Amber Heard was uh, tested very, very high, 98 percentile, I think, on malingering and feigning. Could you speak to that, please? Sure. So, I mean, she said a lot of things. So let's go through those tests. The first was the PAI, and that's that other oh, broad. God, she's doing it again. Objection, non-responsive. Look at that face. I think it's very responsive. It's sustained. I'll, I'll do, okay. Could you tell the jury about the PAI test that Dr. Curry yes. addressed? Yes. So, yes. Uh, thank you. So that's the broadband measure that has validity scales built into it that gives us indications about how the individual goes about the test. I told you last time that there was no evidence of malingering or exaggeration or feigning. Oh, as on if that anybody test. believes what that. What Dr. Curry was talking about was she his, um, feigns everything. To she exaggerates put your best everything. Foot forward to it's obvious. Faults on this PAI. That scale was right at the cusp. 
Yeah, and right. And then there were two other measures that we looked at. Because she was faking. Say, you know, is this enough for an elevation for me to consider that as a serious response distortion of which Dr. Curry was saying, and it was not. What was relevant on this test mm -hmm. was there were elevations on anxiety, on effective anxiety, meaning anxiety, tension, worry, on traumatic stress, on um, hyperactivity, and on affective instability. Those were the four scales that were elevated on this test. The borderline scale was not elevated on this test. And this test- Objection, Your Honor, may we, may we approach? Yes. Yeah, this woman is a real piece of work. She is incredibly unbelievable. If you were, if you saw her last testimony, you'll see that she was doing everything she could to try to smear Johnny. She was basically saying that men can't be victims at all, ever. Um, and she was taking things that Amber said as opinion and basically asserting them as facts. Things that she couldn't possibly know because she wasn't there for these events that allegedly occurred. Um, you know, by the way, uh, if you are new to my channel, please consider subscribing. Uh, we're very close to getting to reaching 4,000 subscribers. Hit the like button. It helps us beat the algorithm, which is designed to elevate what YouTube refers to as quote unquote authoritative content. Uh, what that is, is mainstream media, which are already on cable news. This is YouTube. It's supposed to be for independent content creators like Dr. us. Curry, let's move to the TSI 2. Dr. So Curry like testified button. about your findings on that. Did you agree with her testimony yesterday? No. Uh, again, because she made you look like a fool. Why, um, what Dr. Curry went back to, which is this 98th percentile, which I told you, in the manual, all you have to do is read the manual. It says specifically that we do not use the percentile ranks for this test. That indicates to me that, you know, Dr. Curry does not know the psychometric properties of this test. And that what? she then is therefore not qualified to interpret it. Wow. Um, that score, the one that's elevated Unbelievable. She's talking about that percentile rank, has a raw score. Amber's raw score is a 10. The cutoff score is a 15. She's nowhere near that level of exaggerated symptoms where I can't further um, look at that test. Secondly, there yeah, are three she scales gained it smartly. About, maybe there's about 20, a little more on the TSI that were elevated. Intrusive experiences, that's when thoughts and memories of the trauma come into your mind when you don't want them. Defensive avoidance, sort of behavioral ways that we try to push out those memories and not think about them. And then relational avoidance, a way of having difficulty in, in interpersonal relationships. Those are all trauma-based symptoms, and those were elevated um, on this test. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hughes, uh, the MFAS, Dr. Curry addressed that as well and had criticisms for your interpretations. Do you agree with that? No. Please explain to the So jury. the MFAS, as I told you last time, is a measure of malingering. It's the only measure of malingering that was done in this case. Dr. Curry did not independently administer a measure of malingering, and there are other ones that she could have done to augment her evaluation. Um, and she kept saying something, the MFAS is not for malingered PTSD. That's wrong on a couple of levels. People who are going to malinger and feign don't only feign one diagnosis. They sometimes talk about all different symptoms that they have, and they exaggerate, and they make themselves seem much worse than they are. So when you're doing an evaluation, you're giving a malingering measure to get a sense of how this person is responding to this evaluation. Now, what you do is you take those three tests that I talked to you about, the PAI, the TSI, and the MFAS, all with valid validity scales, you have greater confidence in your results. And that is in the literature, and that's literature that Dr. Curry cited in her report that bolsters the methodology that I used. That in the study <laughs> that had the PAI, the MFAS, and the TSI oh, in the title that's of detecting feigned from bona fide PTSD. Thank you. Now, oh Dr. my Curry goodness! Also talked about the danger assessment scale and suggested She's in love that with you herself. had appropriately interpreted that. Do you agree? That's also my incorrect. credentials. Please describe for the jury. Which I told you last time, the danger assessment scale has statistically validated risk factors for serious or lethal domestic violence. Those risk factors exist whether we go forward, we're sitting with someone in an acute setting and assessing them right now, or if we look backward. 
and we look retrospectively about what factors may have been present in a case that indicated severity. That instrument is used in what we call, there's called domestic fatality review boards. Those are boards after somebody has been killed, a homicide has occurred in a domestic situation. They look at these risk factors to see what was there and what could be done. All right. Dr. Curry also uh, criticized your uh, administering of the CAPS-5. Do you agree with her criticisms? I do not. Will you please explain to the jury? So the, the CAPS-5, as you all have heard multiple times, is a structured clinical interview in determining um, PTSD according to DSM-5 criteria. Um, on this measure, Amber Heard scored in a moderate range. She did not over-exaggerate on this test. She could have said no. <laughs> mild, moderate, severe, and extreme. All of hers were either twos or ones or zeros. Not above that. So she's scoring in the moderate. So range, she's trying to game it. I mean, we don't want someone to be having moderate PTSD, but that's not an exaggerated profile or exaggerated response style of someone. If she who's, did it totally um, exaggerated, incident. it would be obvious. The she's trying to make it not the obvious. It was the PCL5. Uh, do you agree with her criticisms of your administration and interpretation of that? No. So the PCL-5 is a checklist of symptoms of PTSD. It is, as she said, it is a face valid instrument. It seems it's very clear about how you can endorse this. But what the person has to do is say, how, how, how disturbed am I by these symptoms? And when you have face valid measures with these other measures that have the built-in sort of villainy scales, you're sort of controlling for that response bias error. You're okay, grifter. For that individual to sort of over-exaggerate. But then what you do with that test, because this is, you know, we're not just administering them like robots, is you go and you do a clinical assessment. And that's what I did. I took what she wrote, what she endorsed on that test in January of 2021, and I did a clinical assessment of those symptoms to see if they meet criteria for PTSD. That is something we do clinically, and I do in my office all the time. Right. And yes, she did meet PTSD from that in January 2021. Thank you. I'd love to now, see Dr. how many you people that she's interviewed that she says that? doesn't yeah. have these symptoms. I agree that I misinterpreted. I agree that I interpreted them. That she misinterpreted them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, and please explain. Yes. Yeah. So I, I mean, I said that before. I, I, you know, my stance on the MMPI and how she interpreted it is, uh, I believe, wrong. And uh, I think most objection, Your Honor. That's the issue we just addressed. All right. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. If you want Elaine, to get it together. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'm sorry guys, but um, is anybody buying what she's selling? You know, for people who aren't aware, um, she has been involved in other high profile cases. She sort of inserts herself into this stuff, you know, like the no. Nexium Dr. case. Hughes, Dr. Curry also testified that a victim of PTSD has to effectively be prone and unable to function at all. Would you agree with that? Objection no. misstates the evidence. Oh, I, she said they couldn't hike, they couldn't uh, move, they couldn't function in any shape, way, uh, shape, or form. Objection. Thank you. Um, no, that is not correct. That is often actually a myth and misconception about individuals who were struggling with PTSD or trauma-based disorders. And you know, I'm often called to answer that and speak to that. Um, you know, people who are struggling with trauma and PTSD are very strong, courageous, resilient people, even though that they're struggling. They get up, they have to go to work and drop their kid off at school and go to the market, even though they're struggling with these symptoms. So I often talk about it as they're sort of walking around with a 50 pound bag of flour on their backs, just sort of trying to get through the day oh, or sometimes God. that button's gonna press play. I'm sorry, and the but gonna start activating we can all head, observe having to think about it Amber's demeanor here. Physiological reactions until they can find We've a way seen her to hit that pause laughing and, and smirking. Again. So they still have- At know, Johnny Depp when he's on the ways, stand. But they go about That's their not lives. someone they're with not, PTSD. You know, totally debilitated. Living in fear. If you have fear. someone in that high range, the highest score is an 80 on the CAPS. Ms. Heard had a 28. If you have someone in the higher range, we have seen people who are, you know, severely disabled because of it, but that's not the norm of people who have um, this moderate PTSD. 
And did you find functional impairment with Amber? Yes, I did. <laughs> now, Dr. Curry also said she's that impaired, all right. It is not within the in scope her of brain. a psychologist uh, to evaluate domestic violence. Do you agree with that? Uh, of course, I don't agree with that. This is what I do you for a living there. day in, day out for 25 years. Yeah, it's your big um, grift. We are specifically trained to understand the profound impact that trauma has on people's lives. That's what we do. No, but you can't division. say what happened psychological association. if you we weren't there. That knowledge. It's and not domestic possible. Violence is one of those profound traumas. Domestic oh violence God, is part counseling. of... Um, state licensing Bullshit. boards that you can't get licensed unless in some states unless you take training on domestic violence. You can't renew your license unless you get. But you're not a fucking mind violence. reader. You're not so a psychic. So people who have you know specialized training in this area, it oh, is you know holding upon training. them to accurately assess for intimate partner violence and sexual violence, and it's oh, more please. important to assess for. This sort of scientific what she's understanding doing is of wrong. what domestic violence is. So you have to assess for the physical violence, the psychological violence, the surveillance, the economic, the emotional abuse, and these are all things violence. Amber did to that Johnny. That is not gratuitous. Uh, that objection. Is understanding. Narrative. All right. The next question. Yeah, she knows exactly what she's doing. Now, Dr. Oh, Chris psycho. suggested that you made a determination just based on personal opinion and just on checklists and a couple of tests that you misinterpreted. Would you agree with that? I vehemently disagree with that. As I stated to you, over 29 hours and 12 psychological tests and reviewing a slew of documents in this case, most importantly, therapy records and interviews, collateral interviews with therapists, using all that data, that is what a, a solid forensic methodological exam looks like. Mm -hmm. And then I made my conclusions based on my clinical education, knowledge, and training to come up with a professional expert opinion. Okay. And, and just to remind, to, to make sure we're reminded here, you were qualified in this court, you in this case, as an expert uh, in forensic psychology, in specifically in domestic violence and in... Um, the, uh, no, I just lost what? it. Uh, Elaine, uh, and get in it violence, together. Correct, intimate, uh, and in trauma, correct? Uh, but objection, Your Honor, misstates the record. If you want to ask the question again. Yep. <laughs> yes, I probably should do that. Um, you were qualified. Hmm? I've got to find my Look at this lady looking at You were qualified Elaine. as an expert She's in like, what forensic psychology with a specialty in domestic violence and in trauma, correct? Correct. Okay, and that was in this case? That's correct. Okay, now, do you still hold the same opinions you did that you gave the jury earlier? Yes, I do. And do you still hold them within a reasonable degree of psychological probability and certainty? Yes, I do. Certainty. Thank you. Okay. cross-examination. Yes, Your Honor. All right, let's go. Let's go, Denison. All right, so, um, you know, I think that for people who witnessed her first spectacle, if you have not seen Dr. Hughes's first appearance in this case, I highly recommend that you go back and you watch that because what she did was despicable. And what she's trying to help Amber do is also equally despicable because they're damaging real victims of DV and uh, SA by the things that she's saying. Um, and that is shameful. And she's doing it for grift. We all know that. All right. Uh, I do not believe that this, that this woman, Dr. Hughes, is genuine. I just don't. Because of the way that she claimed men could not be victims, she seems like an ideological feminist, in my opinion. You know, somebody that hates men um, and uncritically believes women. Um, and look, and anybody can lie, male or female. Good morning, Dr. Hughes. Good morning, Mr. Dennison. The last time you were here, I believed that you testified that you had diagnosed Ms. Hurd with PTSD before you gave the gold standard CAPS-5 test. That's correct. Right. And that diagnosis is actually reflected in the first of the 
disclosures you put forward in this case? I believe the first disclosure was February 2021. And at that point, I had done um, 11 psychological tests. That's correct. Right. And your disclosure reads, Ms. Hurd's responses on the PCL-5 support a DSM-5 diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder with an etiology, etiology of intimate partner violence she experienced by her former partner. You remember writing that? That's correct. Okay. You just testified that you need to read the manual, right? Oof. Yes. Okay. Can we put up 1311 as a demonstrative? Any objection to 1311? I don't know what it is, Your Honor. All right, okay. if you want to approach. Okay, so, um, you know, I like to provide my own commentary here uh, without being, you know, disrespectful. But I really don't like this individual, and um, I think that they've done improper things in other high-profile cases as well to try to make a name for themselves. And as part of uh, what I see is an ideological crusade, um, and that, to me, is shameful. And it doesn't matter if you're a fan of Johnny Depp or not. I'm not a big fan of Hollywood or actors. But I They're also right am not a fan no. of liars. Uh, let's use thirteen twelve. Thirteen twelve. Okay. And that. Any objection to that demonstrative? No, Your Honor. Okay. Thirteen twelve can be published to the jury. Doctor Hughes, um, do you recognize what the National Center for PTSD is? What it is? Yeah. Yes, I do. And and they publish. Um, the PTSD checklist for DSM-5. That's correct. That what we've been calling the PCL-5. Correct. All right. And do you, uh, are you familiar with the document that's uh, on your screen? Yes. All right. What is it? Uh, it's the instruction manual to how to administer the PCL-5. Okay. I'd like to move for the admission of 1312. Any objection to 1312 coming into evidence? No. All right, 1312 and out. Right. Can we go to the second page? Can we blow up the second paragraph on the right? That's oh. The PCL-5 should not be used as a standalone diagnostic tool. Considering when considering a diagnosis, the clinician will still need to, do, to use clinical interviewing skills and a recommended structured interview, e.g. the CAPS-5, to determine a diagnosis, correct? That's what the, that's what the manual says. Right, and this manual okay. also says that this is a screening instrument, so when you do the clinical interviewing, you absolutely can determine diagnosis. So the answer is yes. The manual says you, 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 you <laughs> still the, need the to PCL use clinical five. interviewing skills, which I use. Uh -huh. Let me finish sure. My the PCL-5 should not be used as a standalone diagnostic tool, and they recommend using the CAPS-5 to determine a diagnosis, correct? It does say that, yes. Yeah, and you made your diagnosis before you did the CAPS-5? I made my diagnosis doing clinical interviewing and 11 other psychological tests that supported diagnosis of PTSD and symptomatology consistent with PTSD. Okay, um, you said that we should read the manual. Would you also agree with me that we need to read the directions on these tests? Sure. Okay. Oh, man. Tom, can you pull up 1309 as a demonstrative? Okay. 
Yes, sir. Thank you. Any objection of 1309 as a demonstration? Uh, may we approach? Okay. Yeah, this is, um, this is wild, you know? It is sort of upsetting to have to, um, you know, if you know somebody's lying <laughs> to watch them try to pretend that they're not, I mean, that is upsetting. But it just, you know, it is what it is. What are you going to do? I I want to see you know, the jury how this goes, though, because I have a feeling it's going to get interesting, guys. Doctor, do you recognize the uh, demonstrative that's in front of you? Yes, but I didn't put the red lines on that. No, I did. <laughs> yes, I know. Okay. Um, so, this, what do you recognize this as? I recognize that we previously discussed this, and I told you that I oriented Ms. Heard to a different time frame because she was already out of the relationship. Right. Okay. Um, maybe we should back it up a little. This is the CTS-2 that you administered as part of this battery of tests that you indicate you, ought, uh, you did in relationship to your diagnosis. Right. This is the conflict tactic scale, too. All right. And you'll agree with me that this test specifically asks in front of every single question, how often did this happen in the past year? Correct, and I right. oriented and the individual know, to not I, I, limit herself to the last the, year to get an accurate assessment of the violence and abuse that she experienced in the relationship. Objection, Your Honor, move to strike. The, All right, I'll move to strike the last part of the answer. Yeah. I'll, I mean, I'll strike the last part of the answer. Thank you. Next question. Yeah, and you know that at the time that you gave this test to Ms. Hurd, she had been away from Mr. Depp for far longer than a year, correct? Which is why I oriented her to a different uh, yes time no, frame in answering the question. Doctor, yes no. <laughs> oriented her. Of course. Her. Okay, you knew she was gone for more than a year. Of course. All right. Let's look at another one of these. Oh, look at her smug smirk. Look at her. You talked about the danger. I'm sorry. You, you talked about the danger assessment test. That's correct. Plaintiff's 1310. Thank you. Any objection to the 1310 uh, as no, a demonstrative? Yeah. Okay. You publish the jury. Dr. Hughes, uh, this is a blank form, but this is the dangerous assessment test that you also gave to Ms. Hurd, correct? I didn't give it to her. I filled it out based on the data that was provided to me. Oh, so you, you asked her the questions and then you filled it in. It, it was somewhat collaborative. Okay. Can we blow up the second full paragraph? It says, using the calendar, please mark the approximate dates during the past year when you were abused by your partner or ex-partner. You didn't use any calendar, did you? I did not use a calendar because she was already out of the relationship. As I said, these are static risk factors, so they don't change. So but I oriented exams, to the time of the re relationship. Ma'am, it's fair to say that every, this examina examination that you gave specifically indicates that, it's, that you were supposed to look over the past year. And you, that's, that's not one, the language? No, that's one administration. People use this instrument for if you're in an acute situation in a relationship, trying to get a better assessment of the current behaviors. We can use it retrospectively, like I just stated, and in homicides and looking back about what are the serious risk factors that were in this relationship. I didn't ask you about anything other than don't the instructions limit this test 
to the previous Ooh. year. You can give this test not only on the previous nope, year. asking you about the instruction. <laughs> but I'm telling you how the test is administered in clinical practice and, and in forensic and you, practice. And opposing counsel can, can come up and ask questions about it. I'm asking you about the instructions. And the instructions say, oh. look over the past year. Dang. And, yeah, on this, yes, that it says that. And you had actual knowledge when you gave the test that Mr. Depp was gone way more than a year before this test. That is correct. Right. Let's look at more instructions. Uh, can we look at 1247, which is already in evidence? Dr. Hughes, you recognize this one too, right? Yes. All right, this is the, what everybody calls the CAPS-5. Correct. All right, can we go to the first page? Let's blow up the instructions. Standard administration and scoring of the CAPS-5 are essential for producing reliable and valid scores and diagnostic decisions. Correct? Correct. And you know you have to do this in a standardized way because it is the first instruction, correct? Correct. Can we go to the next, uh, to the next page? One more. Oh, wait. That's good. This is a page on scoring, and, and we talked about this last time. Yes. You score these tests by frequency and intensity. Correct. And you'll remember that in every single instance that you were asked to fill in the blank about frequency, you failed to do so. Correct? That's not correct. Oh. You, you filled in any blank on this form with respect to frequency? I filled in the frequency on the side of the CAPS where I am actually scoring the CAPS. No, where, I asked you whether relevant. you filled in a single blank on this form with respect to frequency. Is the answer to that yes or no? I don't know what you mean, a single blank. All right, let's, let's page down. Let's keep going. All right, let's, we'll, we'll stay at this page for a second. Uh, this is the very first box you're asked to fill in as to, I, I think, a fairly fundamental question, right? What happened? We talked about this before, Mr. Dennison. I had 88 pages of notes of what happened. It would have been redundant to put it there. You know that you are obligated to produce this test in a way oh. that other people can meaningly review them. Yes. The people in this case who are meaningfully reviewing them have my 88 pages of notes. Right. But you chose is... to put absolutely nothing in the box, oh the standardized goodness. box, that said what happened. You don't have to put it in the box if you have it somewhere else. It's because not a, this if is it's not, not a standardized a test? Well, if it's not a research instrument that is used for research, oh. if you're using it for a clinical diagnostic purpose, no, you don't, if okay. you have that data elsewhere. Okay. Let's go a, another page or so. All right. Let's go another one. Let's look at item 4B4. And I asked you whether you filled in the blank about frequency. And there's a blank in many of these items that asks number of times. You didn't fill a single one of them in, did you? Right, because I filled them on the right side of the instrument where I am scoring it. And that is the way that you believe that you followed the instructions of a standardized test. Yes, correct. No further questions. All right, redirect. Very briefly. You used the term static risk factor. What did you mean by that? Static risk factors are risk factors that don't change. It's maybe. Um, if you smoke cigarettes, you may have a risk of lung cancer, right? That's a factor that doesn't change. You can look forward if someone's smoking. You can look fast if someone's smoking. So these lethality risk factors are present whether you're evaluating them in the last year or five years ago. 
And when you're trying to assess for trauma related to the interpersonal violence that we discussed, um, why is it important to get a time frame in which the relationship was in existence? Well, you want to see the amount of trauma that the person experienced. The longer that they're in a relationship, you have more success of trauma. And one of the things that we know from the research is more trauma is not better. So the more success of traumas that you have, the greater likelihood that somebody's going to have psychological consequences and symptomatology as a result. And therefore, you need to get it within the relationship. Objection and, leading. And, and, and so how does that relate to needing to get the time frame in the relationship? Well, you need to understand the, the when, you're under, when you're trying to evaluate the impact of something, you want to have to understand what happened to the person. And that's sort of the core and the basis of, of trauma-informed care and of trauma diagnoses. You have to understand, you know, the traumatic event and how it transpired and how it because played out talks for that individual to the jury. so that you can better assess for the symptomatology that's falling from it. You said you had 88 pages of notes. What were in your 88? And without going oh, into the specifics, God. can you just describe what was included in the 88 pages of notes? Um, in the 88 pages were um, many of the documented incidents of intimate partner Objection, violence. Objection, Your Honor. She's just describing it. That came up. He said <laughs> 88 he pages of notes? Boxes. She said it was in my 88 pages. I'm just saying what was in your 88 pages. I'm not asking her to give each of the specific events. She can describe the summary of it. Can we come up? Okay. Yeah, this is, that's crazy. What is the difference between clinical scoring Explain and your clinical evaluation pages of notes. and research evaluation Ridiculous. with respect to the CAPS-5 and the other tests? When it's in you, compound. <laughs> sustained. Come on, Elaine, get it together. Wanna, when it's compounded, because it might be confusing what? to the jury. Good. Sustain. Next question. Did she really just try Can to fight with the judge the again? What the difference is between clinical scoring, she's unreal. Evaluation on a test and research. Section, Your Honor, compound. Oh, that, overruled. Good. Sure. So the the PCL and the Elaine CAPS seething. are frequently used in research, and when they're used in research, that means the document stands alone. They don't have eighty eight pages of notes to help understand the background of the trauma and what the person has experienced. And why those boxes may be relevant in research is because, you know, back in the day when I was a research assistant, I had to input that into the computer. And then they would maybe look at some of that data for the research study. So that becomes re very important in research. All right. Thank you. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. You can Thank have you. a seat in the courtroom where you're free to go. That okay. was Thank ridiculous. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and take our afternoon recess. I All mean, right, sorry, so what do recess. you guys think of Dr. I'll just Hughes? Take a 15 minute recess. Do not Let discuss me know the case with anybody in the comments. Outside research, okay? Do you think she did good today, or do you think that once again she just said a bunch of gobbledygook nonsense? You know, um, let me know.